This is the Danae Jamar request. And believe it or not, whether you like it or don't like it, learn to love it. Because you have to listen to Wrestling Is Real. It is the best thing going today. Woo! The worldwide leader of podcasting excellence. The king of podcasts radio network proudly presents The Wrestling Is Real Podcast. Because wrestling needs us. All wrestling fans are so bitter and fickle and complain so much. You know, I am so sick of seeing the constant commentary. And I shouldn't even bother looking at all because I constantly look at complaints on, you know, the AEW product on a regular basis. Trying to watch Dynamite. You know, of course, there's always the... (laughs) The comparisons of WCW tonight, seeing Malachi Black being spilled with blood, which, yes, I remember it was Gangrel and the brood that did the bloodbath back in the Attitude Era days, right? I got it. And so that's Adam Copeland bringing that kind of character back. So Gangrel might be returning. We don't know. But, of course, the wrestling fan of me remembers New Blood and remembers Kevin Nash on a particular episode of Thunder. And what was it like? April of 2000, I think it was, that we had the infamous bloodbath that did not happen because Kevin Mass, the, the blood completely missed him when they tried to spill it on him. And I remember they had to cut away and it barely got on the Kevin Ash at all when they had to try to do the thing with him. So, like, I just remember that too. But the thing is, the complaints about, oh, but look at the crowd. You can't even hear him tonight, right? When they're in Bakersfield, California at a 2500 seat arena that they guess they sold out you know the crowd portion everyone wants to complain about that on the fans the loyalists okay the fickle fanatics of the wwe right meanwhile let me ask you this folks i want to just bring this point across hmm? just just thinking about this so when we look at the premium live events right now for the wwe right I just want to make a point of a few things here. How many premium live events have done, have been done this year in America? Can we just make that point real clear? Can we just make that point? Hold on. Let me just ask you this. Okay. So again, when you look at the upcoming lineup of events for WWE, right? Besides the shows that are going on in America, right? The North American shows we already have. You do understand that aside from SummerSlam and Cleveland, for the next five events are in overseas. Saudi Arabia, Glasgow, Scotland, Toronto, Berlin. And if I want to, I can probably go farther ahead too if I want to go and take a look at it, right? I could probably go a little bit farther ahead. And so let me look. Okay. So again, Clash of the Castle is in Berlin. Then you have Money the Bank, which, by the way, is in Toronto, like I said. Then you have, again, Bash in Berlin. And we want to go ahead a little bit ahead of that. Well, then we have to wait for Survivor Series, which I think is in, is in Boston, right? And so what else do we have? I mean... For everybody complaining about the crowds, the pay-per-views, let me put this point. The pay- premium live events that you watch every month from WWE, right? You know, they have outsmarted the fans. You know, part of the reason why the premium live events are actually are so appealing and so entertaining is because they when they do events now for WWE, this is the TKO, this is the mindset now where, you know, Nick Khan... I think he has to be a responsible for some of this as well. So taking this out to an international audience, the pay-per-view is going out to the international audience, which was not a Vince McMahon thing. Obviously he never really put himself out there to go and take the show out there to everybody else for Saudi Arabia for $50 million a show. Absolutely. But now TKO group holdings and the followers they're in to make the excitement of WWE because it's a world spectacle. Every paper, we always get a little bit of a notice of like, oh, this is so exciting, so great. Backlash, you know, normally would have been just a shit show after WrestleMania. 
But no, because it was in Puerto Rico last year and it was in where, you know, it was in France this year. Oh, wow. And look at the crowds and look at how they respond to it. These crowds that never get to see these folks ever, especially for a live event. And when they know they're going to be on television live and they want to go ahead and show out, they do. So the Saudi Arabia crowd, absolutely they're going to be like bonkers watching the show on Saturday night for them and Jeddah. Berlin, we're going to get another France with all these hooligan type fans for Germany going to go showing out once again for the Bash in Berlin, just like Clash of the Castle also showed out. The thing is, is that you can only do that for so long, okay? The idea that the wrestling shows, when you're feeling so excited for them, it's the excitement that you're feeling as a WWE fan right now. It's not so much what you're watching on TV during the middle, during the week, okay? The excitement is, it's not the spectacle of the storylines that are building up to the matches. It's where it's being held. We got a tournament match. Cody Rhodes and Logan Paul. Other than that, you know, we got some other matches to go ahead and look at, but really... Of the card that you have this weekend, for a show in Saudi Arabia, Becky Lynch, Liv Morgan, kind of run of the mill. It is a match they've kind of set up. We don't get Chad Gable versus Sami Zayn, which has been set up for a while. Still waiting to get somewhere with Sami Zayn, to, or actually with Chad Gable to go and see where he's going to go, because you know he is moving along, slap, smacking around his Alpha Academy. The Creed Brothers will probably be coming in, and they will you'll be accompanying Chad Gable's going forward as the full heel character comes into play. I mean, the Chad Gable character hasn't had too much to go on with Sami Zayn, too much interaction between those two, not so much. More has been Otis with Sami Zayn, right? So they're going to build that part. And then Bronson Reed with like one promo that's kind of just like, eh. He's added in and he gets a little bit like 30 seconds backstage and like, eh, it's basic. Basic Bronson Reed promo. Basic big Bronson Reed promo. And then we're going to see about Tamatanga or Tangaloa and Randy Orton. No, Tamatanga and Randy Orton for the King of the Ring finals against Gunther, which will probably be Randy Orton and Gunther and the King of the Ring finals. For a crowd, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. So Gunther is downgraded from the IC champion after a 666-day reign to King of the Ring. So are we going to go with King Gunther? Are we going to really care? Is there going to be much prestige behind that distinction? Hmm. And then Lyra Vercuria against most likely Bianca Belair. Okay. So decent matches. This For those two matches they're going to have, Gunther, Randy Orton, you know, for the IC title, what's going to happen is, are the storylines really great? Absolutely not. No. But is this crowd in Saudi Arabia, this, you know, stadium? Well, it's just a jet, so it's going to be probably in a big arena. So, you know, what, if it's 20, 25,000 people, jam-packed Saudi Arabia, happy to see this event happen once a year. I mean, listen, Saudi Arabia makes everything I mean, pretty solid. I mean, hell, I saw the Tyson Fury fight last week. And, you know, people were really much into that. Big time. So the Saudi princes get the crowd here. And of course that crowd is going to make that, that whole show go bonkers. And people are going to be excited about the show because of the fans. But try to put this show, this card right here in front of an American crowd. And, and let's not pick a big city. Let's not pick LA. Let's not pick Chicago. Let's not pick Boston. Let's not pick New York. Let's not pick Miami. No, no, no. Let's pick, okay, let's say like, okay, Greensboro, North Carolina. Let's pick, you know, Denver, Colorado. Let's pick Corpus Christi, Texas. How do you think this card is going to stand out at those venues? That's why they don't do those anymore. So WWE already has the upper hand on all of you. Most of these pay-per-views, you're not going to get to see in your hometown. You're not going to see them near you. If you're going to go to an event, you're going to have to fly want to go to wrestlemania in vegas yeah you're gonna go to go fly there and spend a boatload of money to go see anything okay same thing for SummerSlam. got to go to cleveland got to fly there hey you're not you're just i mean you're not going to get the gun to see the the these premium live events near your city not anymore 
It's not going to be like that. No, no, not the Providence. No, 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 not the Stanford, Connecticut. No, 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 nothing like that. It's all going to change. And so wait for this all that could be coming here. The idea is that it's smoke and mirrors, folks. The aesthetics. It's all these other arenas that can do all these extra things, right? Again, Backlash was just a regular show. Again, Cody Rose, AJ Styles was your main event. The stand out right there. Otherwise, I said it during that pre- recap, premium live event in front of France. Those people don't ever get a show in Lyon, France. And those people, again, they were so impactful. They changed Jey Uso's entrance to replicate it. Hell, it got viral even before that. And now they try to do it in Greensboro this weekend. And they try to do it last week and wherever they were, Jacksonville. Right. And it's like, okay, yeah, they're trying to replicate the same thing. And the crowd, they just can't do it. Just really can't bring it up the same way. So when you have that there, you think about that. Okay. You want to talk about all oh, the big crowds. Ooh, you know, in AW, they struggle with some of their crowds. They can't get enough people for a collision when they go to Canada or whatever. Okay. And they go to these smaller arenas, which they, for the most part, they should keep doing. Let's be honest. Just keep doing these smaller arenas. Don't go for the big arenas yet because right now, you know, even Jim Ross is saying the star power, they have to build those stars. Something's got to happen. They got some people back there that are saying the right thing. If Jim Ross is saying that back there, that means that kind of mindset right now is being thought and put in front in AW. So they got to figure it out. That's just, that's where they are right now. They have storylines. They do put time in the storylines. Okay. Are they very impactful either? Yeah, they're pretty good. I'm happy with them. I mean, they did quite a bit tonight to kind of go prop heavy on it. You know, Swore Strickland swinging a chair on top of an SUV to attack Christian Cage. They do go, they go gangrel brood new blood on Malachi Black. And then Darby Allen comes up with a flamethrower on the Young Bucks, the EVPs. Like, okay, we could get more of that every week. A little more spice, a little more pop and circumstance. Let's do something here. Shake things up a bit. But it still comes down to the fact that what you're watching in WWE, right? Your shows, hey, you got your things. The crowd already knows, oh, we got these interests or whatever. But what about when they have the matches? What about the matches, right? I kept hearing about, oh, Lyra Vicuria and Eos Sky. They had a hell of a match. Crowd sitting on his hands didn't matter didn't matter and i'm trying to think about what else can you do here to kind of build things up because it's like okay in the storylines we have right now we're looking at the tournament matches they had for king queen of the ring they're just kind of there right obviously there's certain stars that are there that people really care about that's going to be the big deal in the matches we had, right? So when you think about, okay, Gunther, Kelfie Kingston, you know, was kind of there. Ilya Dragunov, Jey Uso. Jey Uso, obviously, the, the, the main person they're going to go and root for. While Ilya Dragunov has not been made into a heel, he's just more of a face, but they put that matchup together. Randy Orton. It's Randy Orton. So everybody's going to care about him. And Carmelo Hayes is just being put, you know, in there and loses in fashion. LA Knight, he is obviously so heralded, but this is the guy that keeps losing while he cheese cheered on on a regular basis. By the way, I did a sub a supporters club episode talking about some of this because the sportster kind of got my gears going. They ground they grinded my gears. So they were talking about like ten stars in AEW that could do best if they were to move to the WWE, right? When I saw that, I was like, well, I'm going to rant about this. So I did about 25 minutes. If you want to catch that episode and other episodes I've done so far that are part of the series, like there are premium, premium episodes, okay, they cannot be heard anywhere else unless you subscribe to my supporters club, $2 a month, kingofpodcasts.com. You can find the episode right now in the supporters club section. You click through it, click through the supporters club, $2 a month, and all these other episodes I have, several episodes already done this month in the last 30 days. You can listen back to them right now. So please consider that. Now, in the buildup again to the King and Queen of the Ring, all right, when I look at those quarterfinals, 
that they held last week. So Ilya Dragunov pinned. So the push for him, Jey Uso takes the pin here, but then Jey Uso takes a pin from Gunther. Clean. What? Jey Uso should be right now, if he wasn't considered into the universal title picture, why he's not a contender right now, I don't know. But Jey Uso also didn't win a chance at the IC title over Gunther either. So Jey Uso is not going to get to be a title holder. His singles run doesn't have title belts. Is that a good idea? Because I think main event Jey Uso fits well enough to get to that point. Because remember, in the WWE main event picture, it's when you have a title. Rarely are you anywhere else but. And the thing is, is see, Jey Uso does not have a program with anyone. He doesn't have anybody in particular he is going up against. Okay? I'm going to say this too. When Jey Uso went out, and he was, you know, clapping himself up, giving himself momentum, only had a couple of people to go ahead and, you know, high five or whatever on the way out to the ring. That minute long entrance that everybody kind of goes, ooh, ah, we don't need that backstage part because there's nothing he's doing right there. I want to see he gets the gorilla position. If he was, I don't want him just going, <coughs> clapping himself up and nothing. He was talking a little bit before he was going to go out, but it was a basic promo the lead up to the gut match with Gunther, right? But the thing is, if he doesn't have a program or like anything he also has to talk about, like give him some promo material, please. Give him some talking points to work off of. Like we can let Jay Uso talk all he wants. He's complete package. But why are we not giving him something more? And then we send him out there for 18 minutes to lose the Gunther. Fuck the tournament. Why is he losing the Gunther? Why is he getting paired up here in the first place? Why is he in this tournament when Jay Uso would be rather serviced best in a program? That's where he should be. He should be in a program with somebody right now, but they don't have anybody for him. Nothing's ready for Jay Uso. Why not? Let's go. What are we doing here? And now, and then another part is, okay, like I said, Carlo Hayes, you're building him up, right? He loses the Cody. Now he loses to Randy Orton. So the build up for this guy, former NXT champion. Former NXT North America champion, right? You all this adulation from NXT. And they have him lose several times on the way out, on the way in, humbling him. So my thought process is okay, we're not going to worry about these younger upcoming stars. But yeah, the sportster wants to go ahead and start talking shit. Like, oh no, we need, they, they need AW stars. You need to go and look at free agents. So let's go ahead and snub. Carmelo Hayes, Ilya Dragunov, all right? I mean, is that what we're going to do? Larry Vakulia, are we going to just go ahead and just like, oh, you know what? If you had Britt Baker come on over, if you had Ricky Starks come on over. So these WWE fickle fans, okay? And by the way, I don't want to go ahead and start calling out my fellow podcast wrestling brethren. And I'm telling you, some of you folks, you make me want to call your names out. I kid you not, man. I am this close I can't put my finger and my thumb closer together about calling you people to the floor and doing this. And I wasn't doing, I hadn't done it in years and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that, but man, you are making it so hard for me not to go ahead and call you out and point out some of your flaws. Is it because you're an influencer and you just want to go ahead and say something just to go ahead and stir the shit up just to create clickbait? Is that really what you're doing it for? All these Twitch streamers as well. Same thing to you too. Because I honestly think some of you do these programs just to outrage people. I actually feel what I'm thinking here. I actually back up what I'm saying here. So I have my criticisms on the product and it's not because I'm bashing this company. Damn it. At the highest point right now, this company's in. And I see people say, oh, well, this is only until they cool off. Yeah, because there's going to be a cooling off period for this company. They're in a very hot time. The Bloodline storyline, the WrestleMania storyline, they pulled off right now, which has only been, what, seven weeks ago. They're still relishing off of that. The hangover is not gone yet. People are still can't, can't help but talk about it. But they've removed that long away. 
Draft has been here. King and Queen of the Rings has been here. All that. Backlash. The French. Right? All that's been going on. And they have not built anything towards it. Cody Rhodes are booking right. Him and Logan Paul makes complete sense to do that for King of the Queen of the Ring. Absolutely. AJ Styles, a good start off. So I don't have a problem with Cody Rhodes and what they're doing with him. That's fine. That's okay. But what else you got? What else you got? That's really building off of here. Like, let's get some real story. Okay, Drew McIntyre, CM Punk. But then, you know, they can have a little bit of time in between. But we're not going to get a match. We're not going to get a match right away. We don't know when these two guys are going to be honestly healthy and ready to go. Maybe a SummerSlam. And if that's the case, we're not going to see these guys, you know, put hands on each other. Not right now anyway. You got that to deal with too. So in the meantime, the time you need to go and build new stars, you're burying them. No, maybe not burying them so much, but it's like, it is the old school thought of like, okay, now that you got Ron Breaker, you're going to change his gimmick up, go from face to instant heel, heel on a jobber, heel on a jobber match. So now he's speed bullet with, you know, his, uh, spears. That's enough to make him heal. Oh, and then he attacks uh, Ricochet. Okay. So we're not going to let him talk. We're going to keep him more or less mute. Like he's talking a little bit here, but there, but not, let's, let's hear him say something after this heel attack. Let's do something there. You got Braun Strowman fucking around with JD McDonough. You're going to have him in a match next week. Ugh. And Braun Strowman for a veteran. Yeah. You need to be using that guy. You need to be using him somewhere, somehow. I mean, I don't know what else you do, but like, okay. And then Tama Tonga, Tangaloa, Bloodline, they got Kevin Owens, they got, you know, Randy Orton. Yeah, they got that they're going to work off of, but still, they haven't really done much more. And, you know, they're just building up the fact that, okay, we believe that there's a mutiny right now with the Bloodline and that Sol Sokoa is putting the wool over the eyes of Paul Heyman. Okay. But Tamatonga, you know, one of his, another match for him, he gets back to LA Knight, but he's going to lose the Randy Orton. So we're going to keep, we're going to keep the, the gates of, of agony. We're going to keep them humble, right? Tamatonga, Tangaloa are not going to be getting wins. And so Sokoa hasn't been wrestling much. So what are we doing there? So he's just a manager. Role? I want Sol Sokoa wrestling. Why is he not wrestling? I mean, okay, if you're going to make him like a Roman Reigns type, then put him on pay-per-view. Give him a match this week. Why why is he not wrestling in Saudi Arabia? What are we waiting for? Too much slow burning on storylines here. Okay. Okay, we're going to repeat the same thing with Otis. We're going to slap him in the face again. Chastise. Chad Gable is going to go and chastise, whatever. And now Karrion Cross is going to set up for Final Testament against New Day. I want something more out of this. Don't just set a seed and then don't do anything with it. Like, let's move along here, folks. You're putting Bronson Reed in here like it's like, you know, again, square peg in a round hole. We don't need Bronson Reed in the feud with Sami Zayn and Chad Gable. Sami Zayn and Chad Gable alone. Do not try to insert Bronson Reed. Why don't you give him Jey Uso? Why don't you set that up? Bronson Reed's a heel. Put him up against Jey Uso. Why don't you do that? I would much prefer that than having Jey Uso losing in a tournament. He doesn't even matter that he wins in here, man. Because like, being king of the wing, ring, it doesn't matter. Jey Uso should be going after a title. But right now, you can't do anything with Sami Zayn because you don't want to go face versus face for the IC title. And I think if it was Jey Uso and Sami Zayn, you're going to have to build that storyline off of what it was, kind of stir things up again between those two and their bloodline uh, issues, which you think would be resolved by now. And then here we go. And Jey Uso would have to win. But they're not doing any service with some of these, some of these main event stars they have right now. They're not doing any service with them. They're not. And that's the part I just don't understand. 
And you know, it's true. Xavier Woods, you know, he hasn't been necessarily the most healthy. Neither is Kofi Kingston, neither. And, and Big E can't come out. So, I mean, I don't know what you could do much with them anyway. And it's, yeah, again, Xavier Woods, you always think, well, well Kofi had his chance at Kofi Mania. Why doesn't Xavier? Because he gets hurt a lot. And I don't know what you what are going to tell you. And I think it's probably because the New Day probably works a lot of house shows. They probably work out there and grind themselves to the bone. But, you know, their chance of being, you know, tag team champions, they've already done that so many times. They're not going to go back to that again. And then you also look at the weakness of the women's tag team division that you're trying to put together. You know, which of those teams do you feel like was going to really be able to go and do anything against Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair? Which doesn't matter because, you know, Jade's not going to be wrestling this weekend. Bianca's going to be in the tournament. Why? I don't know. Like there wasn't a whole lot of thought process like, oh, we just need some certain stars going to be in the king and the queen of the ring, but really not thought process like who's going to really, like who needs to be protected and all that throughout these stories, throughout these matches. Just matches that have matches. And I wish this company would be a little more concerned about wins and losses and put a little more emphasis on that. Like your younger upcoming stars, do you need them to already take a loss so early on in their main roster run? Is that smart to do that? Like Tamatanga already takes, you know, he's going to take a loss coming up now. Tungalo, I think, is already taking a loss. Ellie Knight always loses. Carmelo Hayes already taking a couple of losses. Leo Dragunov taking a loss. Tilly Stratton taking multiple losses. I mean, Braun Breaker's still doing the squash stuff, but now they did a little spin to it. This doesn't help me. I, I'm not happy with this here. I mean, they have veterans they could be using. I think they're just not getting utilized right. If we're going to, and the thing is, this is why we get the conversation we always get where the young upstarts, once they start getting not the right push to, and they're, and you know, the seeding seedlings planted for them, they don't bear any fruit and they don't move up anymore and they don't become developed and get over on their own because they're not getting help to get over on their own. Okay. Of the stars I really see right now that have really gotten over it, Tiffany Stratton, that Tiffany time stuff, the main roster crowd, they're all into it and they're all into her. So she should have broken through the ranks. Why is Lyra Valkyria? Because they want it to be. They're going to push Lyra Valkyria down your throat. Oh, she beat Becky Lynch. And so we're down the line. I can see where Becky Lynch and Lyra Valkyria are going to face each other again, but you're going to push that down everybody's throat. And make her come out strong? I don't know. I don't see it. But I'll give us some time. And Liv Morgan, the revenge tour? I'm tired of hearing that too. The revenge is already done. She already took care of Rhea Ripley, revenge tour. I mean, if you give Liv Morgan something else to work off of, because let me tell you, that that back and forth with her and Becky Lynch, man, that was basic. And that just really had nothing to it. Give me some heat to build up. Look, and AEW at least they give you some fucking props to build up heat for matches. At least they did that. At least you remember that going into double or nothing. Is it great? No, not so, not much better than that. But let me tell you, you know, at least with Swerve Strickland's Christian Cage, I got I got heat to build up for that match. Anarchy in the arena, we got heat to build up on that match too. I mean, you know, Tony Storm. Serena Deeb, yeah, we got a little bit of heat. Will Knight and Mercedes Renee, Knight, we got a lot of heat for that. And Mercedes Renee is starting to pick herself back up where she left off on promos. Good. I mean, for go-home shows, right? Think about it. Did I get some heat right now for Will Ospreay and Roderick Strong? Eh, somewhat. Undisputed Kingdom, they're kind of being like all over the place, in personally my opinion. There's a little too much going on there to really keep up. Moxley to Kesha, yeah. Could be a good match. Again, anything with Don Cows, I'm all in because it's just the way they set up. Undisputed World Trios Championships, they just set it up. Bang, bang, gang, death triangle. They've already had to deal with Pac, Pac, and they're setting that up. That's great. FEW title, yeah, there's heat. Chris Jericho's always good at building up heat. So I got no problem with that there. But there's no heat building on the King of the Ring. Not really. I mean, do I feel really, I mean, 
take Bronson Reed out. Like, honestly, eliminate Bronson Reed for the IC title match. Sami Zayn, Chad Gable, they don't want to give us that straight up. So they got to insert Bronson Reed in here, who's just like, you know, odd man out. Am I overly excited about the King and the Queen of the Ring? Ring? Eh, good matches. Good for Saudi Arabia. But if you put that in front of a normal crowd here in the, in the States, it would not go over well. It would not. Remember, there was a reason why King and Queen of the Ring used to always be on television and not their own pay-per-views. Becky Lynch, Liv Morgan? Nah. Her, Liv Morgan's heat is with Rhea Ripley whenever she comes back. I'd have preferred that Liv Morgan kind of like took a step aside and they had the thing set up for Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan because that's the match I want to see. Not her and Becky Lynch. I, I know they try to set it up. They give us a reason. It hasn't been a great reason, but Becky Lynch needs an opponent, so you have to give her Liv Morgan. So there you go. Not much else you could do. I said with Cody and Logan, they set the thing up right now where Logan Paul screw you know screw job scumbag. Now he gets the, his the universe the U.S. title is not in the line. He made sure in the contract to get that, and Cody Rhodes is agreeing to it. So like whatever, he's super baby piece. He'll overcome for sure. Logan Paul is easily a guy you can hate. So he's in his right place. He knows his role. So let's go ahead and get into some of the commentary that's out there from several people that I do respect when they do make their comments about respective companies. And one of the guys I always like to go and fall back on that always continues to give voice of reason. You don't like it. Like I said, I don't want him booking anybody's company. I don't want it. Because the truth is, the booking of matches, I'm fine with. You know, I'm not a big deal about it, okay? And other companies, hey, you know, what Billy Corgan's doing right now in NWA, I like what they're doing. They're set up. It's good. Still can't find the Crockett Cup. I couldn't find a chance to go and watch it. But, you know, I'm following along with what they're doing. Now they're going to have the uh, Back to the Territories event coming up. That's good stuff. MLW with Fury Road. That was great. Mads Cruel Kruger and Matthew Justice. And... Kruger and the Contra unit. Oh, I love that stuff. And uh, what was it? Janai Kai, now part of that. I'm just waiting for Joseph Samael to come back. Get him get him back out here. Come on. I want to see who's part of the new, out of, outside of the Zentai Death Squad and all that stuff. Give me some more. And I'm surprised the World Titan Federation right now is kind of like st- stuck in the mix, but really, you know, there's that. I want to see what happened to Selena De Laurenta now that she's been trapped and taken hostage once again by Cesar Duran. That's all good stuff too, right? And by the way, MLW, I should take a, uh, I should take a, a Supporters Club episode and just talk about that because I've been enjoying MLW immensely. It's been good. Come on, we had Sammy Callahan and Matt Riddle. Those guys tore it up. Wow. And I should take time to talk about TNA. They've also been doing good stuff. And I got a guest all all it's ca- uh, coming up. That'll be also really cool coming up for them as well. That's a lot of good stuff. What can I say? All right. First of all, Vince Russo. And like I said, I'm just so happy when he comes on here and starts talking, man, because he will talk about the stars he really feels like are standing out and the ones that are not. And he's not the right person to book, but he does see the talent in the right way. He, For the most part, he's pretty, about 90% right on the people that should be getting pushed versus the ones that he shouldn't be, that shouldn't be pushed. Or shouldn't be, are not getting the push that they're making much of it, right? So Vince Russo was on Sports Kita's Unscripted. And he criticized the current roster, saying that 10%, only 10% are true professionals. He named Randy Orton, Roman Reigns, Gunther, and AJ Styles as examples. And then he cited Liv Morgan, Indy Hartwell, and Candice LeRae, whom we kept referring to as Francis LaRue, as unfit for primetime TV. Here comes Vince Russo in my impression. When I put on Raw, I am just seeing a lot of people who I feel do not belong. And I agree with him. And it's not because of the standard of stardom that these stars are able to make. But you have to understand, when he names the names he just said right there, when he's saying Randy Orton, Roman Reigns, Gunther, AJ Styles, absolutely correct. Those are bonafide WWE superstars. No question. Liv Morgan, 
I would give a little more benefit than doubt. She's had better times. I think her run with Ronda Rousey was probably her best, and she can do better. I honestly think she could do better. But yeah, you know, I'm, I wasn't really big about the uh, about the squad. wasn't much about that. But I think Liv Morgan could do better. I just wish they had done something more with her. I mean, I like her. Don't get me wrong. I like her, but I think they just going to do more with her. And he goes on to say that one of the people that Russo feels does not belong is Bailey. And that's very interesting. Now, she has a lot of audiences and serenade her with song. Russo sees Bailey as someone who went through the training but doesn't have it based on her ability to cut promos. You know... I think Bailey, when she was with Sasha Banks and they were kind of at each other, that rivalry, that was good. I thought, I think anytime her and Sasha Banks together, always they, they drew well and they always did good. Bailey, for me, being the heel, I like her better than her being a face. Because now Bailey reversing and still having the kind of the heel persona, but turning babyface because of the being betrayed by damage control. It's not working. I need to see some mother change to Bailey, but people want to see Bailey the way she is. Here he goes. He says, quote, bro, when you watch a Bailey promo, she should not be at that level after 10 years. And if you are not cutting a believable promo in 10 years, and it sounds like a wrestling promo, you are not good at what you do and you probably shouldn't be doing it. And there are at least 50 Baileys running around the WWE right now. With better material, she's better. I honestly believe that. I think what what's being given Bailey, Bailey on her own, she needs something to work off of. Her injury work, I got no problem with that there. And I don't think you'd think too much about that. Like it's him is obviously it's not about the ring work. It's about the promos. And he's right about that. He is totally right about that. But Bailey's being exposed right now because when they are very light on material to work with, this is why I talk about actually really giving storylines so that there's something more for these folks to talk about. Like for Liv and Becky to go ahead and like kind of work off each other with barely nothing to work off of. Okay. Because they want to give so much freedom to these stars to kind of work it out themselves. There's not much of a storyline to work with. It's very light. We need a little more weight to the storyline. We need something more, a little more tangibility to it. Because they pretty much got what they wanted to say the first week after Rhea Ripley got hurt and Liv Morgan made her point. They're just kind of repeating themselves. It doesn't really help much. It's not going to build much to the storyline. What? Why didn't they do anything really just to kind of build up towards Liv and Becky to build up more heat? But they didn't. It was kept light. It was just not much more there. They, discuss, they discussed wrestling's needle movers. And Russo defines that as someone he would pay to see. And of those names, he highlighted Rhea Ripley, Damian Priest, and Gunther. He praised the handling of Gunther until his defeat by Sami Zayn, who Russo doesn't see as a needle mover, despite Zayn having headlined several events. Well, Sami Zayn's best point, you know, him with Kevin Owens in matches, great. They're the feud with each other. Yeah, that was really good. That works out well. And Sami Zayn, I think he's done fine. The conspiracy theorist, the stuff with the Johnny Knoxville thing, I think he handled that fine. His bloodline work, being the honorary ooze, was his best work. I wish we could have kept more on that. But the thing is, he's basically living off of that. I got no problem with Sami Zayn. Again, he needs something more to work off of as well. The, the Chad Gable stuff is fine. I got no problem with that. I think that we could do something more. Russo dismissed damage control. Yes. Because the truth is, and I feel this on hard, Dakota Kai doesn't fit in this mix at all. She might have fit in some ways in NXT, but I think she's always been a wrong fit with damage control. And the damage control shouldn't even be a thing. And the whole Kabuki Warriors thing, like Asuka should be standalone. I don't know. And I think it's because Asuka stands out so much on her own as an international star in that company. It's so hard for other stars to come in here and just, you know, take a place. Like when you see all these other, when you see all the luchadors you got, with the God of the Phantasma or with LWO. 
like Rey Mysterio is the guy. And to try to put in Santos Escobar kind of as the precursor, like the, the guy that's supposed to be the understudy to Rey Mysterio. And then you have these other stars, you know, with Joaquin Wilde and, you know, it's like, eh. I mean, what are you going to do when Axiom is going to be moved up from the tag team title division with Nathan Frazier and Axiom is going to go up there? Well, how are they going to fit, right? I mean, the thing is that, and what about, you know, Korea, Humberto, and Angel? They also are just kind of lost in the mix because the company really only does good when they only have like one star of a particular country and they can use that part as like a gimmick. The Rey Mysterio is the luchador. And, and I mean, Andrade, they can't even really do much with him because of the same thing. Andrade has been kind of like lost in the mix. As long as Rey Mysterio is there, he stands out. And on the, uh, and of the women that they have, Asuka, and I would say Eosky as well, they hand in hand can all actually handle things if they were on separate channel, uh, if they were on separate brands, right? Because Asuka just stands out alone. She does not need a crew. So that whole part never really made that much mention to me. But I know Oscar came and infiltrated. That was how Bailey got, got kicked out. Whatever. But Dakota Kai, nothing. She's cute. She wrestles okay. But she's not made for this company. So I agree with Vince Russo on that. He also says that besides Rhea Ripley and Damian Priest, dismisses the rest of Judgment Day. So down on Dan- Finn Balor, and I said, well, Finn Balor, listen, if you don't have the demon character... You're just Finn Balor, and that's the NXT version of Finn Balor. I don't care how good he is. After this much time, you want Finn Balor to be something more. But I think him in that mix is fine. But Jeannie McDonough? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Don't make sense. Like, I get what they're going to do with Jeannie McDonough with Braun Strowman. The big guy, small guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a Vince thing. That's a Vince move right there. But that's what they're going to try to do, and you know, we know JD McDonough's not going to get a win. Like, I don't know if they're going to do anything where Judgment Day is going to find some way to infiltrate and make it where Braun Strowman's going to lose to JD McDonough. No, no. Russo mentions Braun Breaker as nearly making his list of needle movers, but that's because of his association with the Steiner brothers, right? Rick Steiner to his father, Scott Steiner to uncle. And with Braun Breaker, I kid you not, I wish. Not Rick Steiner. Rick, you know, he's great. Don't get me wrong. But I wish Scott Steiner in just almost like a a managerial role, he would stir shit up on Braun Breaker. Because what I want from Braun Breaker, we don't have any emphasis as to why he turned heel. We need an explanation. If you're going to do this here, bring back Scott just for the sake of getting his nephew, get him going, right? Because Rick Steiner came out during NXT. You can bring the whole point about Rick Steiner coming out and accompanying his son. But it's like, no, Scott. Scott's the heel. Give me Big Papa Pump coming back into that company to get Braun Breaker where he needs to be. And then let Scott Steiner say, hey, take my moves. Go with it. You know you've been working off my work, so go do it. Go do it. See, I, I, I don't even want the fact that... And the thing is, I'll tell you like this too. I know with Braun Breaker... The whole, you know, dog face Grimman thing. Pat McAfee wants to play that up. No, wrong Steiner. Wrong Steiner. We need Braun Breaker to embody Scott Steiner as Big Papa Pop. We need him to turn into that. Not, don't turn your head hair white, but I want that intensity. I want that vitriol from Braun Breaker coming out as a Scott Steiner clone. Like that should be the nepotism that he... He embodies himself more after Scott. He embraces Scott more than he does his own father. Like, give me that part. Like, give me something here. Because if you give me Braun Breaker and it's a bit of a nepotism role and he's just kind of going on his own and he's getting rebellious because his, his, you know, his badass uncle's like stirring him in the, right, in the wrong direction. Yes. Oh my goodness. That'd be wonderful. Like, let's do that. Let's go. By the way, with all these small guys, with Ilya Dragunov and Jane McDonough, why isn't Omos wrestling? Like, if you need some big guys to come here to make some legitimacy out of these stars, this is why uh, Daniel Bryan or Shawn Michaels and all these others, you need to get some bigger stars in here to legitimize these smaller stars to make them important. 
They can't just be wrestling the same size guys. That can't be happening either. You need some big guys. This is why they used to always do that. So get Omos back out there. You want to have a Braun Strowman, but don't make it where that Braun Strowman is going to be losing here. You want to take Omos and give him a loss? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So Russo said he would cut at least half the talent seen on Raw this week, including Sami Zayn and Liv Morgan saying, quote, forget the people you are never going to get over. Then he argues that the last of the good group of wrestling professionals came from OVW. And I've said the long time, like the stars, they really pulled out. Okay. I've said the roster, the class that they came out of that was remember that's John Cena, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, and Dave Batista. That's just, that's just the pro start right there. And that's it. Russo argued that, you know, the decline in new stars can be traced back to the beginning of NXT, a flaw in the current system. Russo said that while Triple H and Shawn Michaels were great wrestlers, that doesn't necessarily translate to be a great judge of talent. He also criticized their favoritism, believing it leads to select talent and their friends getting top spots on TV. It's the same shit that, that Kevin Nash did on, on Nitro. When Kevin Nash was head booker for a while, same thing goes. Because sometimes you get that kind of thing and it's not best for business. Hey man, Bob Mould and Kevin Sullivan... And some of these others that are out here, like some of them, they don't get the right idea. When you get bookers like Dutch Mantel that want to book the younger talent, and because you know what, maybe they're not really behind them, but like they see the talent in them, they know they need to put the best talent forward, not the folks that they are, they have a, a liking to. That doesn't work either. I get that part. I agree with that with Rosso. He's right on that. And then he talked about Russo says, then quote, Shawn Michaels, for whatever reason, thinks Johnny Gargano is the second coming. So let's start with Gargano. Bro, who's Gargano married to? Francis LaRue. He says, you know, okay, Candice LeRae. Okay, so now Francis has to be on the show. Bro, who are the best friends that had a little click at NXT? Well, that would be Ciampa, and that would be Indy Harwell. So now they're on the show. So there's this one person Shawn liked. Now that parlays into four people. He, the way story, and that's, I'll tell you, and that's why we haven't seen Dexter Loomis in a while. They tried him and it didn't work. Man, he's absolutely right. I know you don't want to agree with Vince Russo, but he's not wrong here. He's not wrong. It's the way I would think about it as well. Am I completely agree with him? No. I would disagree with him on Liv Morgan and Sami Zayn. I would disagree with him on that. They've done enough that you could build them back into, into being being in the right place and the right heat and the right stardom, the the star power they can have. Because I have never had an issue with either Sami Zayn or Liv Morgan being champions. Like I was, I, I was happy for Liv Morgan being champion when she beat Ronda Rousey, as the way it was booked. I was happy with seeing Sami Zayn, IC champion. I was like, I was just surprised that Gunther was going to lose, but. Okay, but if it's going to be Sami Zayn, okay, I'm fine with it. I haven't said it in. I'm fine with that. I got no problem with that. But again, you got to build that story. You got to build that storyline and build the fact that Gunther had that IC title. Sami Zayn inherited that IC title reign. The prestige of what that belt means now after Gunther held it, you know, for almost two years. All right, back to it. Russo says favoritism is why it's been to the WWE. Extending beyond individuals like Shawn Michaels. He suggests that the company's investment in Larry Vicaria and JD McDonough, who he doubts will get over with fans, is solely due to their respective connections with Becky Lynch and Finn Balor. Yeah. Okay, so Finn Balor wants to go ahead and get, and that's where, you know, I didn't know that either, but okay, so that's the part two. They want to make it where, you know, JD McDonough, Finn Balor, like probably, you know, is speaking highly of him. Give him a chance. Trust me, Jada McDonough's had a lot of chances to go and ground and get in here. Larry Vercuria, because of Becky Lynch. I get it. It's nice of them to get a chance to be on the roster, but they just can't have it just because, you know, somebody, you know, put in a good word for them. No, where's the work? So Russo suggests that an entertainment company with an eye for talent intervene and dismantle these cliques, which he claims didn't exist when he was writing TV. Quote, I was responsible for the ratings, 
me, bro. You didn't pull ratings. You weren't on the show. I don't care who you are. I don't care who your buddies are or who your friends are. It's all about pulling a number. You don't pull a number, bro. You're not on the show. It's that simple. About 90% of what he said right there is absolutely true. So there's the one side about Vince Russo. Now let's go on the other end. Because Jim Ross also commented, AEW, the biggest challenge for them right now is creating new stars. So let's go into here's, and I'm not going to do any, I'm not doing any impression of JR. That's not me to do. Okay. Nothing like that at all. JR was busted open today. And he gives AEW a solid B when that's the greatest current company. And I would, I would agree with that. I mean, they're missing some stars. And one of the things I think with AEW that I always have a thing with is that I kind of forget, like there's some times where, you know, some of the stars they have, you know, they're not on consistently. Some are, and I have no problem with that. I don't think I'm, I think what Tony Khan's trying to do is he doesn't want to saturate both dynamite or collision or rampage with the same talent over and over. He wants to be absolutely what not the WWE is. He wants to be absolutely nothing like that, but he's doing it a little too well because there's certain stars. I want to see a little bit more of that. I think I almost forget. Like it's not so much sat and I'm seeing, but I, I like to see Jay lethal and Jeff Jarrett and son and Sanjay Dutt. I do like those folks together. I do. And then you have like, you know, death triangle. I haven't seen them in a while. I'd love to see them more. House of black. I'd love to see them more. Roosh, I'd like to see him more. You know, there's just some other stars they have that are in the company. I wish I could see more of, you know? So the question is, what needs to happen to get AW's buzz back? So Jim Ross says, quote, I think a lot of things can be proved upon. Like anybody else's company, AW's challenge right now is really creating new stars. Somebody on that brand's got to get hot. That's got to be, I think, what they need right now. Somebody's got to get hot. Then Bully Ray asks Ross if he thought creative could make a wrestler hot or it's more on the talent. And JR thinks it's the latter because, quote, creative can get you in the ring, but once you get in the ring, it's up to the talent at that point. In my estimation, I think it's a talent-based thing. Bully, I really do. And more than a few folks on all sides of AEW's discussion would probably argue that several wrestlers have gotten hot for the company, but haven't been able to sustain or grow their popularity. Would that be and then be on creative? But I think there's certain stars that, you know, you'd like to see a little bit more coming off of again, the pillars. Well, MJF still hurt. I don't know what's happening with him, but again, he's been away for more than a few months, six months now, no word of him coming back. Darby Allen. He's got the rub off of things from sting, but no title runs right now. Swerve Strickland has gotten hot at the right time. They booked him at the right time to be champion. I got no problem with that there. And then I think some other stars that they have that have been hot and then they just kind of like drop off. Kenny Omega, Hangman Page are some of the names I think of. You know, you think about like they have stars that are, you know, again, standouts that, you know, so many good veterans on the roster with Black Bull Combat Club, pick any of them, right? And I think about like right now, the elite, we don't get much of Jack Perry, but right now Jack Perry is on like a roll right now. Scapegoat. I want to see him in the ring. Why can't we get him in the ring sometime? I mean, fine with young bucks and they want to do what they're going to do, but like, you know, you got them and then you got all these young these stars you brought back in, right? With Will Ospreay, they're trying to build him up. No problem with that. Is he the best promo cutter? No, not necessarily, but the bruv stuff that works for me, I got no problem with it. He's do, he's putting in the work. He's trying, he's got good effort. Okada, yeah, if he's building with the, the elite, he's fine. He's got the Continental Crown. You know, they're using him just, you know, not a whole lot, but sparingly. They want to keep him keep him special. When I think about Konosuke Takeshita, they're going to get, try to give him another shot. We're here with Moxley, and I think he beats Moxley this week in the Eliminator match, so I'd keep an eye on that. But again, like Takeshita, they're also using him in New Japan, this and that. Like, here's... There's a little bit of the crossover, like what other companies are using them. So with New Japan, there's a little bit of that changeover. And I think about like, you know, of the younger stars, there's that part to me, I think is what it is. Ricky Starks is also in that mix. But again, I don't know, just I guess the punishment from him with the CM Punk thing, I guess, is what is his issue. So we don't know what's more, much more is going to go on to that. 
But in the meantime, things are still good for both companies in terms of, you know, their shows. Okay. All in Wembley looks like it's going to do pretty well. I don't know what their ticket sales look like so far as of late, but we can go check back down on that and see what they're doing. And then otherwise I try to think about still off for that. They're going to be fine with that. Forbidden Door is going to probably get sold out. So like the pay-per-view is going to be fine when it comes to AW. SummerSlam also off to a good start. And the latest check right now is that they already have sold over 50,000 tickets or are coming up on 50,000 tickets right now. And the current capacity at Cleveland Brown Stadium is 52,679. And so they got that all set up. They're doing fine with all that there and their current setup. And for Tony Khan, Double or Nothing will be sold out this weekend. Looks like they're getting all their tickets sold out. That's fine. They're going to be celebrating their fifth anniversary. Tony Khan talked to WRKR, the Rocker Morning Show, and mentioned his attack on him by the Elite and other things. And... Tony Khan says he's got some good plans, something special that's going to be planned up for double or nothing. So they're all fine on that end. Again, the good thing is wrestling still pretty well. A lot of shows are doing really well. Listen, when I see the NWA is doing some bigger events, they're doing some bigger venues when they were doing Dothan, Alabama. When I see that, you know, TNA is doing shows like the Palms and Cicero Stadium and, you know, they're kind of moving along a little bit better. It's a bigger arenas and all. That's good. The show in Canada going to be doing for Simiversity, also good. When I see MLW doing 2300 Arena on a regular basis or Cicero Stadium and I see crowds over there, man, they're doing all right, man. At least these, these shows are doing somewhat something there. I, I like the fact that I'm seeing crowds at these shows. We're not seeing a whole lot of, you know, barreling uh, on this, but like it's for some special events, wrestling's, you know, putting some shows out there, which is good. I'm glad to see all that. Some other things came across the board when it comes to WWE when they go onto Netflix. And like I said, once that show on Raw goes to Netflix, I want to know how people are going to be able to go and get used to the fact that, I mean, what Netflix is pricing right now, I think I think my brother told me today it was, what, eight ninety nine right now if you wanted to go ahead and buy on there. Like, I'm trying to figure out that part. The pricing plans, if you're going to buy Netflix now, at this moment, the pricing right now, standard with ads, Six ninety nine a month. So ad supported, all but a few movies and TV shows available, and you can watch on two supported devices at a time. That's it. So if you're going to go and buy, you'd have to go and buy that six ninety nine a month. So the ads, you're, you're going to have to get used to the ads, just like always. Standard, if you want to not, not have the ads, fifteen forty nine. And then you want to have an extra member on there, seven ninety nine a month. Premium, twenty two ninety nine. Now, let's put this point as well. Okay, the basic plan, by the way, is no longer available for newer rejoining members. So that used to be a different thing they had to have. They don't even have that anymore. So now you're stuck in a spot. Like, okay, here we go. Now, you got to ask yourself, if you're going to be willing to go and pay more money besides the money you're already paying on Peacock to watch premium live events and the money you pay on other pay-per-views, okay, how much are you willing to go ahead and get out of your way to go ahead and watch just raw, not a premium live event, but just raw. That's what they're also talking about as well. So here's what WWE is already planning to do right now. So again, we know that's going to be January, 2025. WWE will be moving over to the Monday night. Raw show will be moving to Netflix. <clears throat> so f 4 is Josh Nason got some notes from the J.P. Morgan Global Technology Media and Communications Conference. And Mark Shapiro with TKO talked about the plans. That there will be a lot of ancillary shoulder programming. A reality series, much like the F1 Focus series, Drive to Survive. So there are going to be documentaries for WWE over there. And that WWE is going to expand its deal with Saudi Arabia over the next 6 to 12 months, and an enhancement will be made and announced this month giving a better look at the company potentially holding WrestleMania or the Royal Rumble in Saudi Arabia. So you won't even get that show in America. That's pretty important, significant. 
Just saying. So let's go ahead and talk about the shows this weekend. I will be doing post shows. They will be available, you know, for all subscribers. So there will be nothing, unless there's something extra I want to talk about outside of the pay-per-views, I'll put them on the supporters club. But the recaps for this week, like I remember the supporters club is just extra content, but the recaps I would normally do that I would always offer on this show. Those are always going to be available. That I'm not going to go ahead and take away from you and put it behind a paywall. If I'm going to put anything behind a paywall, it's going to be extra stuff. That's my promise to you. And like I said, I'm not asking for a whole lot, $2 a month. That's it. If you want to just do a donation, that's a great way to do it. And I would be fine. And I would love that. And I would be grateful if you did that with me. So if you want to do that, please consider it. Okay. So King of the Queen of the Ring this weekend. We already know right now that, as I already said right now, the King of the Ring finals, I'm guessing it's going to be Gunther and Randy Orton. And the Queen of the Ring, it'll be Lair Vicuria and Bianca Belair. And then from there, Bianca Belair and Gunther will win King of the Ring, Queen of the Ring. That's what I think is going to happen there. Sami Zayn will win over Bronson Reed and Chad Gable because I think Bronson Reed is going to be a mix and a mix. And I think Chad Gable, something's going to happen with Chad Gable that his own Alpha Academy is going to turn against him. And then Chad Gable and that whole thing will break up. If they're going to at least move storyline forward, they might as well do that. Becky Lynch will beat Liv Morgan for the women's world title. And Cody Rhodes will beat Logan Paul for the WWE Universal Championship. That's what I think is going to happen on Saturday. And I will do a post show after that, later in that night, Saturday night, kingofpodcasts.com. You'll find it right there. Or on the YouTube channel. Of course, you can always find my stuff on YouTube as well. And as for Double or Nothing, Double or Nothing this weekend as well on Sunday night, TBS title, Will Knight, Willow Nightingale and Mercedes Monet. I think Mercedes Monet will win. I think Swerve Strickland will defeat Christian Cage for the AW World title. I'll say Will Osprey will beat Roderick Strong for the international title. Tony Storm will beat Serena D for the AW Women's Championship. I will take the Elite over Team AEW and Anarchy in the Arena, which is uh, Okada, Jack Perry, and the Young Bucks against Darby Allen, Brian Danielson, and FTR. That's what I think is going to happen. The barbed wire steel cage match. I'll take Adam Copen, who will probably have Gangrel or whoever else is going to come along to a company, and they will take out they, they they will take out Malachi Black. And then the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship Eliminator. I'll take Takeshita over John Moxley, and I will take Orange Cassidy over Trent Beretta. And that's it. That's the show for tonight. Oh, sorry, FTW title. Also, Chris Jericho. I will take Hook. No. Yeah, I'll take Hook to defeat Chris Jericho versus. So it's Chris Jericho, Hook, Katsuria, Shibata. I'll take Hook to retain the FTW title. And the Trios Championships, I will take. Oh, man. I will take Death Triangle to win over the Bang Bang Gang. G. White and the Guns. That's what I think is going to happen there. All right. So please come back this weekend. A lot of great. Great wrestling coming up this weekend. Great pay-per-views. I just want great wrestling all across the board. So, Saturday night, recap for King and Queen of the Ring. Enjoy it. Sunday night, recap for AW Double or Nothing. Join me for that. And until this weekend, enjoy both shows. Come back for the recaps this weekend on the Wrestling Comes Real Podcast because wrestling needs us.